Hey everyone. Um, thanks for having me here today. It's really fun to talk to this crowd. I, uh, I did uh, a very similar set of slides to this with this like big B2B enterprise company, I think two weeks ago. Like half the people, engineering managers, came in, flew in from the East Coast. They're all wearing like jackets and ties. And the room really couldn't be more different than this one. But I'm going to ask you the same question that I asked them. How many people in here know what Airbnb is? OK. I'm pretty sure that was everybody who was able to raise a hand because they weren't holding a fork or something. Um, at this other one, I think about 25% of the room's hands went up. So I spent the first 10 minutes of the presentation just trying, you know, explaining what it is that we do. I'm glad you guys are familiar. Um, let's see if I can get this more. All right. So I'm actually I'm going to cover like three general areas today, and then I think I've got probably like 25 minutes of slides, something like that. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit. I've worked at a bunch of different companies, and I think I've got a little bit to share on culture and what that means at these different places and how it affected me working there. Um, I thought that might be interesting for you since you're at the beginning of lots of companies, um, 33 of them I'm told. Uh, and then I'll talk a bit about Airbnb's growth, so a little bit about how we've grown internationally, uh, give you some visualization on that and some thoughts about why it's, it's grown, and then we'll talk about payments at the end. And you know, after that, I want this to be pretty interactive, so if you have questions for me at any time, just like shoot, and I'll do my best to answer. Okay. Oh, it's a clicker, all right. Thanks, man. Cool. Which one do I push to go to the next one? Does it not work? Well, well that kind of failed. So <laughs> I'll just try. Oh, that's all right. Even my. Uh... Oh, there we go. All right. So I put, all, I put this together again like three weeks ago, and I was totally blown away by this. But I've, I've worked at a lot of different companies. Um, strangely, like, Almost all of them with blue logos. I think I'm like really into companies with blue logos. Um, but this is like a pretty, you know, wide range of, of tech companies I've been at before. Um, you guys are probably familiar with all of them. I assume everybody remembers Alta Vista back in the day, right? So I'm just going to talk a bit about like um, the differences between those companies. So um, so far, I've been in Airbnb for about nine months. Before that, I was at uh, Facebook for two years. Before that, I was at Yahoo for a long time, leading the mail team, um, the entire mail team. And one of the things that I learned from that is that um, vision, it, like from all these companies, is that having a vision is really, really key to being successful ultimately and to having a good culture. And I know that, that probably actually sounds like really obvious to this crowd. You probably have heard a lot about like having vision and and culture. I was presented as this company the other day, and they're like, well, what if you're a company that doesn't have a vision? <laughs> One of the questions. Um, so I think the way I think about this is that uh, you have to reinforce why you come to work every single day. And that's not just for you, but also for all the people on your team. So people want to come work somewhere where they know that what they're doing has an impact that's beyond just like making a paycheck or like you know solving some problem that isn't that interesting, like they want to have some greater purpose in what they do. And I think that if you don't have something in your brain turning, like reinforcing why you're at work every single day, then you're going to get a very different culture out of that than the one that you want. And so to illustrate that just a little bit, think about the companies that I've worked at in the past. So Alta Vista, actually back in 98-99, was an incredibly mission-driven company. Like everybody there was there to like invent web search. It had never really been done before. And there was this core of people there who were as excited about web search as like the core of people that you find at Facebook today who are you know crazy about connecting the world. And it was because they had this idea that what had never been done before, they had this incredible sense of, of purpose. And it wasn't really until you guys probably don't remember this, this guy Rod Schrock came in to lead um, Alta Vista, and what he decided was they weren't actually in the web search business. What they were in the business of is competing with Lycos and Excite and Yahoo. You guys probably remember those, those companies. And what happened was, instead of sticking to like what the company was really about and what people were passionate about, they got sidetracked on this other thing. And then Google came along and got you know, web search right and totally ate their lunch, right? Alta Vista went from like high riding in 99 to pretty much out of business by early 2001 because of the rise of Google. Now, 
they had no reason to lose that game at all, right? Altavista was first. They were the first ones to do it. They did it really well, but they just got sidetracked. They lost sight of their vision, and they tried to get after something that wasn't like the core of what they did. So after that, I worked at AOL. I challenge anybody in the room to tell me what AOL's vision was, or is. There's one. Are the internet? Okay. <laughs> the vision is own the internet. That's a little broad. I know, I'm just... <laughs> <laughs> it was the same for me when I worked there. And I worked down on the Netscape campus, and I remember that, you know, nobody there was there for anything more than, you know, having a, a, a tech job. You know, like, oh yeah, I work in tech. I get, I get paid every day, and I have no idea what this company is doing. And I went from it well, not directly, but almost directly to Yahoo. And Yahoo was interesting. It was there were all these different big business units of Yahoo, and within those business units, like we're talking about, like hundreds, thousands of people in each one of these things, there was some sense of mission and purpose within the unit, but there was no overall like, what the hell does this company do? And you know, it's like the famous question, like what Carol Bartz, what is Yahoo? You know, and then she reads back a paragraph. It's really hard to get motivated and excited as a company to go somewhere where you can't answer that question. So the biggest thing I tell people, I get asked all the time, like, leaving Yahoo after such a long time, going to Facebook, what was the biggest difference between those two places? The number one biggest difference was that when you walked into Facebook, it was immediately obvious that every single person knew why they were there and knows why they're there. And like, it, it manifests in lots of different ways. Like, People can articulate what the vision of the company is. They think about how their work ties to that company. 80% of Facebook is wearing a Facebook t-shirt on any given day. At Yahoo, you see like two or three on any given day. It's just a very close connection with what's happening um, every day. So the mission of Facebook very clear. Going to Airbnb has been a kind of similar experience where we hire people who feel very connected to the mission that we're doing as a company because we want to have that same feeling. We want people to be there for a reason and feel like they're doing something bigger in the world. And so why am I even like, talking about this stuff with you guys right now? You're all at the beginning of some company that one day will be you know, the next Google or Amazon or whatever. You can never start too early figuring out like, what you want your mission to be and what kind of culture you want to create around it, like what your values are, and then reinforcing them now and even hiring for them now. Because once it gets away from you, it's very hard to fix it later on. This is a little bit of all of what I was just saying. Commission-driven companies tend to have great cultures. You've got a mission, you can build your culture around the mission. This is, was my clear experience from working at AOL, but going, not knowing why you go to work every day totally sucks. Um, and maybe the best way to say this is as you think about building that culture, it's really important to bake into your hiring. So you have to think about what matters to you, like what are the values that you uh, subscribe to and to make up your culture, and then don't hire people who don't fit into it, right? And I say, like, don't hire competent assholes. I mean, that's easy, right? Like, you don't want to hire people that you don't want to work with. But it's also, don't hire people who are competent and good, but just aren't a fit for your company, right? There are some people out there who are going to be great, but they really should be somewhere else. They shouldn't necessarily be um, in your place. That's actually one of the hardest decisions to make. When you've got somebody who's really good you're desperate to hire people. There's so much com like competition for hiring, and you've got somebody that you know can do the job, but you don't feel like they're a fit, like want to you know, have the same vision or values that you do. That's the hardest thing to say no to, but it's so important because, again, if you let this stuff get away from you, then later on, you're Yahoo, and you're trying to go back and fix a culture that has been broken for a long time. So, anyway, I thought I'd share that stuff you know, having worked at a bunch of these different places and seen a bunch of different ones. I don't know how many people here have worked at, you know, like at Google or Facebook. Anyway, that's two. That's two people on this audience, all right, not that many. Okay. Um, do you guys have any questions on the culture stuff? I'm going to talk a little bit about Airbnb growth next, but I mean, is this stuff that you hear all the time, or is this like, are these novel concepts to you? Yeah. I kind of curious about, you said 80% of the people I guess, I mean, you said they identify with culture. Can you just maybe expand a little bit? Because you think that's all naturally they all want to put their t shirts on? Or do you think there's like some influence? Or? So the question is 80% of people at Facebook wear a Facebook t shirt every day. Why is that? Well, one, because they hand out a 
t-shirt about every five days at Facebook. So you always have, you always have a new t-shirt. So that's one piece of advice is give out lots of t-shirts. But I think the other is that people really identify with the company. You know, I've been gone for almost a year and I still carry around my Facebook bag, right? Like it's, it's something that people feel very proud of. They know what the company is doing. They feel like it's doing something that's important in the world and they identify with it. So why wouldn't you want to wear a, you know, a Facebook t-shirt every day? Been there is probably familiar with this. Mark does Q and A um, for 45 minutes or an hour every single Friday, and what he'll do is at the beginning of that, like the whole company is invited, like you know more than a thousand people tune in uh, every week, and in the first 10 minutes he'll just sit there and talk about whatever is on his mind, and he'll tie back the things that are on his mind to whatever the most important things are for the company, and to how those things like push forward the overall vision of the company. And this happens like, every single week. And then it'll take 45 minutes of questions. So there's like this incredible <coughs> sense of transparency and repetition of here's what it is that we're working on and why we're doing it. I think that that's been really valuable. It's something that we're trying to emulate now with our, our team meetings at Airbnb because as a company grows, that problem of communication and keeping people on the same page gets exponentially harder with the, you know every single person that you add. And so, if you don't figure out like the right case where people feel it's safe to ask questions and they're getting a constant reinforcement of what we're working on, they'll lose sight of it. Um, yeah, I think Facebook did a good job at that. Other companies like the strategy at, at Yahoo was often, oh, we'll have you know we'll have a quarterly meeting and we'll bring you know bring all the executives out on stage and they'll explain to the company here's what we're doing for the next quarter. The thing is that doing it once every three months is just not nearly enough for people to feel like they can even ask questions in that forum or to even remember you know, from the day they work how it ties back to what's happening at the top. Also, I mean, I think the other problem with that is that they didn't really have a great answer to the what is our vision question. Any other questions on this stuff? Do all of your companies have like clear visions and values? I have a couple of questions. Yeah. <clears throat> well, that company is uh, Start early startups usually end up pivoting. Like you start with a mission, you're really excited about it, and then it kind of change. It doesn't reach product market fit, so you have to do something else. Sometimes it might be different from the original thing. How should the company of the, the how should the culture of the company uh, evolve or like change, or is that okay to to go through? Or? The question was, what about early stage companies that pivot? And yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think that. Well, I mean, here's the thing: if you're going to pivot and the new direction is not something that all of your team is excited about or feels like they can really get behind, then you might lose part of your team around that, and that's okay. But maybe the answer there is that, you know, at the beginning of a company, the values that you're looking for are people who are very versatile and who feel um, very excited about the nature of the work, not necessarily like maybe the specific thing. And so, you know, maybe over time, as you, you know, establish your vision and the thing that you're really going after, then you start hiring people who, um, attached directly to the vision as opposed to like the nature of the work. Now it's off the cuff. I haven't started a company uh, at this size before, so I don't know. Should I, should I start talking a little bit about Airbnb growth? Yeah. Yep, great. So um, I'm just gonna voice over a few slides that show uh, you know, the growth of the company over, over a few years. Um, what, what you'll really see from this is that it took a long time to catch on. Like I think that's probably the that's probably like the core of the story about Airbnb is that it wasn't overnight at all. Like people hear this amazing story of all these people <laughs> traveling on Airbnb today, but the fact is that in the early years of the company, the only reason it got off the ground is because like the founders and small teams of people were going city by city, meeting with every single host in that city, like personally talking to them about what hosting was and getting them excited in the platform. It took a long time to get to critical mass to the point where it became like a self-sustaining uh, growth system. And so what this visualization shows is the circles represent the number of listings in different cities in 2009. And so the only city that had more than 1,000 listings in 2009 was New York City here. By the way, I was looking at this, right? does anybody know where that is? Denver? Omaha. Wait, I heard like eight answers. Does anybody know which one that is? Denver? Right, Denver. Denver? Denver. All right, cool. I'm gonna confirm that later. I couldn't figure out which city that was. Illinois, New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles. So that's kind of where we were in the beginning. The growth ramp was pretty incredible. So 2010, you can see that we started getting into lots of different cities in the world. Um, 
very small presence though. That's like, every one of those blue dots is only 50 to 100 listings. And what we found is that once somebody has traveled to one of the cities, right? Like once somebody has gone to New York or gone to San Francisco, they've stayed with a host and had a great experience, they go back to where they came from and they're like, hey, I could probably make some money doing this. So they go ahead and list their, their property. But the problem is that when you've only got two or three places listed in a city, then you've got a chicken and egg marketplace problem, right? Like there's no inventory there to search for. So why would anybody search for it? So they don't get any demand. So why would they list their property? And so the way that we really grew in all these different places is that we did targeted ways to generate demand on the market through like online marketing campaigns, running campaigns on Facebook and Google. And by going on the ground to different cities to get more hosts involved, to do host meetups, like meet people individually, make sure they stayed on the site. Basically to the point where in any city that we get past 100 listings now, we've got a pretty predictable growth curve. So by the time you've got 100 listings and we can generate some demand to your market, it's, it grows very predictably from that point out. If we're anything less than 100 listings, it's kind of like we have to invest some time to make sure that the market can get off the ground. So that's the, what is that? That's the 2010 slide. In 2011, you can see that it's starting to get into the other parts of the world, very big in Europe, um, and started getting into South, um, South America. And then 2000, so, and then it was really 2012 that the thing totally took off. So you can see that Airbnb is now in um, well over 10,000 cities. Actually, it might even be more like 15,000 cities. Um, it's in 192 countries. And the point I'm trying to make with this is just that the growth part at the beginning was very, very manual, but you had to like get the engine started through manual work. And as soon as like the manual work had been done, then the network effects of the business started taking over and things really spread a little bit crazily. And what we'll get into in a minute is that operating in this many con countries creates a pretty interesting payments problem since we're in between the payments transaction, but I'll get to that in a minute. Um, just to give you another sense of the ramp up. So in the first about four years, it took about four years for Airbnb to get to its first four million guests on the platform. Um, but you can see that as it took off in the last year, it only took us a few months to get to the next four million like on, the, on the growth curve. And it's because of that, it's because of that chicken and egg problem is out of the way, right? Like, now we've got significant inventory in all these different markets, and we've got enough, because we've got enough inventory, we get enough demand. There's somewhere that you can stay in that market, so people will search to go stay there. And so the ramp just like, you know, it's really taking off. It's gone a long way since this slide was created, too. Um, this is just a fun stat, so I'm going to show it. Um, right now we have, on any given night, we have about 150,000 people staying in Airbnbs around the world. So it's getting to the point where, you know, we have about 150,000 people staying every night. We have uh, over half a million places listed on Airbnb. <coughs> we don't really like to compare ourselves with hotels because it's a very different type of travel experience that we get. But if you take like a Hilton or somebody like that, they have a little bit more than 600,000 rooms in Hilton. So we're getting to the point where, in terms of like available space, we're getting close to some of the biggest hotel chains um, in the world. Now, our occupancy rates aren't as high as the Hilton, so we've got a little work to do on that, on that side. Um, the last thing I'll show on growth is, you know, just some visualization of the first uh, few thousand trips that happened on Airbnb. And the point here, again, is that the growth of our business has really come from the network effects of somebody goes and travels here. There's an incredible, you know, web of uh, travel where, you know, from any city, there's probably like outbound destinations or people coming in from destinations where Airbnb hadn't started yet. And that travel experience created um, the network effect that went and got people to host in lots of different uh, cities around the world. So that was kind of the, the fuel to our growth. Different companies have different problems around this, right? Like if you're, if you're Uber, you get the advantage of word of mouth, like people say Uber's awesome. But the fact is, if you want to go into a new city, you need to like send in a ground team and get a bunch of cars and like do a manual setup process there. We're kind of lucky that because individuals can set themselves up this way, they can go back and start getting things off the ground without us necessarily needing to go into every single city. 
you guys have any other questions about growth? I can tell you, you know, more about like some specific tactics and things that we've used, or anything problems that you guys are facing now. Yeah. How did you guys deal with, I guess, copycats in other countries where you might not be able to you know, protect your IP and that kind of thing? The question is around copycats, um, and there are still many out there, uh, but probably the. <laughs> Probably the worst copycat situation that we ever had was Wimdu. Has, has anybody heard of Wim, Wimdu? Yeah. yeah. Two, three hands, four hands. All right. Well, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> I'd rather you heard, heard of everybody. Wimdu was actually this incredible thing. They went out and raised, I think, close to two hundred million dollars to compete with us, like to compete with Airbnb. Back when Airbnb really wasn't that big, especially in Europe, and they they raised all this money. They spent all this money on advertising, and our response to that. I say our response to that, this is before I joined the company, but you know, Airbnb's response to that at the time was we actually created 11 offices around the world with ground teams that could go around market by market and make sure that we weren't losing inventory to Wimdu. We cut down on the scrapers, like they were trying to scrape our listings and like add them to our site. We put in a whole bunch of preventative stuff um, to not allow that. And we really just doubled down overseas where we thought we, where we, thought we were weak and where Wimdu was strong. And uh, ultimately they couldn't catch us. So. They, and this is sort of like the great thing about a marketplace is that once you have that engine going, like you've got supply and demand um, satisfied and balanced out well enough, it's very hard to compete with that marketplace. It's like, why isn't there another eBay out there, except for you know maybe in China, um, where there are other uh, better reasons. <coughs> yeah. Oh yeah, I have a different question. So, like, could you get a little bit more in depth on how Airbnb commits like the first fifty? to let strangers stay in their home and just like uh, just how do you guys so the question is how did how did Airbnb get the first 50 people yeah, like the seeing? very first initial customer bid yeah well it's, it's hard for me to tell too much of the story because yeah, I wasn't there at the time but I can tell you what I've heard uh, second hand which is really that um, in the early days they were actually in YC right? <laughs> um, and they got the advice it turned out that most of the hosts they were in San Francisco right and uh, Brian, Joe, and Nate were in San Francisco. Most of the hosts were actually in New York, and they got the advice from uh, Paul Graham at the time. He's like, why are you here when the only people that matter to your entire company are in New York? You should go to New York, and th they did. They went out to New York, they stayed there for multiple months, and all they did was host uh, meetups, like get people together. They would go have individual meetings with every host to like address their concerns and figure out things that you know, it could be a problem, and basically just get them engaged. So it was a total ground game in New York when Airbnb was getting off the ground. And it wouldn't have, like, I don't think it would have grown at all had they not done that. I think that it probably, like, because it was such a, like, strange concept that you would let somebody come stay in your house, I think that they had to be, like, literally hand-to-hand -hand for these people to get them uh, to the beginning. But then once, you know, you see enough people doing it, you reach that critical mass point, then other people are like, well, it can't be all bad. There's 20,000 people doing it in New York, right? Okay. Did, was there, um, I mean, there must have been some hesitancy also from the guests as well. Were there guest meetups? Were there guest explanations? Or? <laughs> uh, we d I think that they mostly concentrated on the host. And it's actually, it's kind of strange, but um, demand has almost never been our problem okay. in the system. Like, there are times when demand is the problem, like when it gets into, into slow season. But almost from the beginning, there's been more demand than there is supply. Uh, in the system, so we're often just close, uh, like solving for getting more hosts onto the platform, so that we can meet demand when we get into uh, into peak season. And I think that the reason for that is probably that you know it's a cheaper way to travel. Like you can, I mean, it doesn't have to be like you can go pretty high end on Airbnb, but if you want to get a deal, like it's um, that can be a little bit less expensive way to do it. Um, and yeah, I guess I okay. guess we're a little less worried okay. than hosts. So, <clears throat> so, I mean, how do you deal with problems of scale? Because I know you take pictures of uh, individual properties, send some out, and there's a lot of groundwork going on. But when after it started doing critical mass, were there certain things you ran into, and how did you deal with those bottlenecks? Sure. The question is, how do you deal with scale, especially like ramping up hosts, like getting hosts to the point where they're they have a good listing and everything else. Okay. This is part of the story I didn't tell in the first 50 hosts, but I should have because it's cool. Is that one of the early things Airbnb did is they made it look like they had a way to get professional photography for your home. So like, if you're listing your space on Airbnb, like, earn more money by having better photos. We've got this whole photography program. But the reality is the only thing behind the photography 
program was Brian and Joe. So what they would do is when you signed up for the photography program, Brian and Joe would show up at your house with a camera and take right. pictures of your house and then put that on the listing. So that, like when you think about ground game, it's like you know about as much of a ground game as you can run. Uh, but what, what they did after that was they figured out this is something that's you know high demand. If you want to you know earn a lot of money off of your place, then you better um, have high quality photos. And so what they did is actually opened it up to um, independent photographers. So now when you request photography on your site, we'll automatically connect you to a photographer in your area and schedule a time to come out and take the photo for you. I think now we work with something like four or 5,000 independent photographers out there that go and you know, take good photos of listings. And we will take listings down if they, don't have, uh, if they don't have great photos or if they don't have full descriptions. We're actually trying to get even more strict about post standards so that like, you can't have a crappy site on, or a crappy listing on Airbnb. We want it to be a high quality experience. Yeah, we'll do um, um, we'll do some things around like we'll do a big push to get more hosts onto the platform. So like we'll run a big like online marketing campaign, Facebook ads, Google, other things that are really concentrated at, at hosts, and we'll do that usually in the um, in the low season, the low travel season. So like trying to build supply and that, like we're really kind of entering the low season for travel right now given where the majority of our business is today and so but as we start ramping up to that high season again we'll switch it around and try to just like fill the supply with um, demand for the guest side so we'll run a whole bunch of stuff when you're searching for hotels or travel or anything else then you'll find Airbnb listings and we we'll go fill up all those places so that's it's one way that we kind of balance like how do you grow the supply side and then fill it with demand on the other side uh, in terms of just like the straight network effect, um, when somebody returns from a trip, so like they went and traveled somewhere and they come back from, from a trip and they're a guest and they look like the right profile person, we'll hit them like the right type of person. Uh, we'll hit them with things on the Airbnb homepage encouraging them to become a host. So we actually do a lot of stuff to try to convert travelers into hosts right at the time when they come back. And like we'll we'll cater that specifically like we like we'll only show them that if they rated the trip five stars. So it's like only if they had an awesome trip on the platform will we try to convince them to become a host. But uh, you know a good percentage of all of our trips are five stars so we get a lot of opportunity to target. Yeah. Um, I have a question on a specific tactic I've seen using. Um, sometimes you try to log into Airbnb after I've been logging in for a while. Uh, right away you send me uh, an email like a trip campaign awesome contest or something like that. Um, okay. What's the logic behind that? The question is, right after I log into Airbnb, I get... After I haven't logged in it for a while. After I haven't logged in for a while. So yeah, I decided to take a trip, I go to the site. So at that point, I'm on the site, I'm engaged. Yeah. But then you still send me an email right away. Is that well, I could be totally honest with you, I didn't know that we did that. <laughs> what, what is the, in the content of the, of the email? Um, some like contest or it seems like an engagement, like a kind of thing I should get if I haven't logged in for a while. Yeah. But I get it right when I log in. I was wondering if there's um, some thinking on that. No, actually, if anything, we're thinking about doing exactly the other thing. What you would expect is if you were. So the, the question is about like the timing of some of the emails, like the engagement emails that we um, send to people on Airbnb. Um, if anything, we're thinking about going the other direction, which is if you have traveled on the platform before, you had a great experience, you know, maybe about six months later, we might send you an email again to say, maybe it's time to go on another, on another trip. Um, so it sounds like maybe there's a broken trigger there or something. I'll look into that when I get back. <laughs> uh, maybe one more, and then I want to talk a bit about payments. Yeah, I just have another culture question as it relates to, you know, in the beginning, there was a lot of kind of elbow grease in, in making it work. And now that it is working, how do you keep that culture going that you can't just sit back and let the product sell itself? The question is, um, how do you keep the culture going when you know, it was a very entrepreneurial beginning, like a lot of hand-to-hands and, and little stuff, how do you maintain that over time? And I think you know, what I was trying to talk about earlier with culture was you, know, you have to figure out what we call them, like our core values at Airbnb, like what are the things that we value in every employee that we bring in, and then figure out how to actually interview for that in a way that gives you the right signals. So like, some, like for example, one of the core values that we have is be a serial entrepreneur. And what that refers to is there was a time when Airbnb was basically out of money, 
they didn't have any funding, they were maxing out credit cards, and the way that they got themselves through was they came up, like Brian, Joe, and Nate came up with this thing where they created cereal boxes. This was like during the Obama campaign. They came up with like Obama O's and McCain Flakes. Did anybody see that? Yeah. Yeah? All right, a couple people. And then they sold these things, and that generated enough, like in this moment of desperation, that generated enough money that they could like kind of keep things going. But So one of the questions that we ask people or like one of the areas that we interview for in the core value interviews that every single person goes through um, is questions related to that, like serial entrepreneurship, when is the time that you've failed at something and then figured out a way to pull yourself out of it. Um, and then there's some other values that we uh, interview for as well, like, you know, for us in, in our business, like one of the things that we care about is that everybody is a good host. And that doesn't mean that they're necessarily hosting on Airbnb, but they have the values of somebody who knows how to host somebody. Um, and you know, put themselves in, in other people's shoes. Um, we care about being very de detail oriented, so we have this other value that we call every frame matters, meaning like every frame of the trip, if you can think about the trip in a series of like storyboarded frames, every single one of those frames matters and we interview for people who have that level of detail, like being detail oriented. So I think it's really about like, if you want, you have to define what it is that you're trying to maintain in order to maintain it, define what your core values are, figure out if you know, a way to interview for them that actually gives you signal on whether these people are a match with your values and then, you know, hold yourself to it. Okay, I'm gonna skip into the next one, um, talk a little bit about payments. Um, I think that even before I get to the payment slides, I think that this slide actually illustrates a little bit of the complexity of the payments problem that we have. Like, we're operating in so many different countries that have so many different weird rules around payments and many different currencies and everything else that um, we've had to do a lot of work to make that possible. Um, and probably the best way to talk about it is the problem that we're trying to solve. So in the beginning, sorry, it's just, okay. Anyway, back in the beginning when Airbnb first started, we didn't even accept payments. So like it wasn't, it was really just about connecting guests and hosts at the beginning. It wasn't about us being a payments platform. Which is interesting, because you think about it, at the beginning of Airbnb, maybe there wasn't that much of a business model. <laughs> um, because payments turned out to be pretty central to the business model. Um, but the only reason that we came on it and, and decided to do it was because we wanted to solve a problem. And the problem was, it, you know, it goes back to a, a story where Brian was staying with a host. And he had been there for a day, and at the end of the first day, the host was like, hey, you know, you know where's my money? <laughs> And Brian's like, oh, I totally forgot to pay you. I'll go to the ATM later and get you your money. And then he comes back, he stays that night, and the next day he forgets again. And after that, it wasn't like a nice, where's my money? It was more of like a, dude, get out of my house. <laughs> you know, where's my money? And that's like a, um, you know, pretty awkward situation, right? And so what they realized is, if we actually started accepting and remitting the payments for this, then you kind of move this whole awkward thing completely out of the way and up front so it's handled before you even get into the process of the transaction and so it can make it much more seamless. So it became obvious to them at that moment that like uh, there's no way this is going to work unless we start handling the payment. So that's where the, the payment stuff started. Um, I'll talk a little bit just about like the evolution. So again at the beginning there were no payments. Um, then we started accepting U.S. credit card so that you can pay with a credit card. Makes sense. Um, we realized that that was great for U.S., but for the rest of the world, we needed something else. Um, so we started leveraging PayPal for international so that you could you know, pay with PayPal and get uh, paid out with PayPal. Um, and then we started adding support for international cards. And so for both U.S. and international, you know, Braintree has been one of the partners that we work with on that, um, as well as uh, WorldPay. And then if you go to the other side, so like this is a two-sided marketplace, right? So you have to accept payments for people, you take their money, and we hold it for a period of time until they go on the trip, and then when they're one day into their trip, we pay off to the host. So then there's the payout side. In the beginning, obviously, there were no payouts. Then we started using PayPal because it was you know, the best solution or the only solution that was out there at the time. Um, and then we started getting into like the more complicated stuff around like doing direct bank transfers um, uh, in the US. And then we also started doing um, international bank transfers and Western Union. And I think Western Union is kind of funny because you don't think about like being a host and 
oh, I'm going to go down to the Western Union and pick up my cash. But it turns out that in South America, and particularly in Argentina, this was like super important. They didn't want to get paid any other way. The way they want to get paid is like in cash. So um, we implemented Western Union, and in the first month, we did I think about like hundred thousand dollars in volume. That has increased like more than twenty x since then of people who just want to go to the Western Union and get their cash. <laughs> So that's kind of kind of funny. It's really popular in in, uh, in South America, and now um, we're kind of working on some other things that are. And maybe I'll talk about this a little bit in like the conclusion slide. But some other things that are like different payout methods that right now might represent like a very small slice of the total payment volume, but might be capping our growth. Like by not having those payout methods, it might be that we're not able to grow more in another part of the world. So I'll just show like the overall payment stack. Um, so this is like how we take payments in. There's us, Braintree, huge amount of our volume goes through Braintree for payments. Um, we still use PayPal. Uh, those go through the processors and then into our, um, into our bank accounts, of which I'm told we have many. Um, and then on the other side, you know, Airbnb's bank account, the same thing I was talking about before, but like we do direct deposit. Uh, a lot of posts uh, really like that because the money just shows up in their account. So very simple. Western Union for people who want to go to the store and pick up their money. Um, and then PayPal for people who want pass to pass to bank accounts. And then we're sort of starting to experiment with these other things, like these other uh, payment methods. We've tried, um, we did a couple integrations recently, and this is like tiny volume on the, on the whole, but like um, AccuLink and uh, Payoneer, which do like prepaid debit cards, which is another thing that where there's some demand. Like, you get paid off by somebody sending you a prepaid debit card and a PIN number so you can go uh, spend money that way. Yeah, L-Y-N-K. Um, so again, just talking about the complexity of the problem. Um, right now we're collect money, we'll accept payment in 32 currencies, and we'll pay out in 65. And so what it means is that in the total number of ways that money can flow through currency-wise, there's over a thousand different combinations. And those thousand different combinations actually happen because people do travel to every single possible combination of ways that you can go around the world. So a lot of what we do is around um, making sure that we have enough coverage of the payment and payout methods that we can actually ser like serve everyone in a way that feels native. Like it doesn't, we can't get it 100% all, all the time, but we get as close to giving somebody a native feeling experience and native currency as possible. And then we have to apply all the foreign exchange rate stuff on top of that. So we, we accept payment significantly, in a lot of cases, up to 30 days before the actual trip happens. In that time, the exchange rates change. We have to make sure that we do the appropriate exchange rate conversion before we do the payout. And then on top of that, we have to make sure, and this sounds like an obvious thing, but it's actually like really complicated, is we have to reconcile every single line item transaction that we have in our database, like every payment that we do, all the way to the bank that actually deposits the money in somebody's account to make sure that what we think we're paying out is actually what's being paid out, which turns out to be a uh, imperfect science in that we'll have, like, on any given day, we'll have a few hundred of those that we have to go through manually one by one and figure out exactly what, you know, where do the line items line up. So it's a, you know, it's a pretty thorny problem. I keep thinking my down arrow is going to work. Um, and then like, the last point here is that you know, for those currencies, they're actually serving, you know, again, 192 countries that, um, that we're operating in today. Yeah. So what's the um, reconciling? So what, what, what's happening there? What's the problem? That's just making sure that like, banks don't have the cleanest interfaces right now. And so what we do is like we um, you know, we'll send you know information like this needs to be paid out by this bank. The bank needs to deposit the money into this account, and then after the fact, we'll go through some strange interface where we'll like download a CSV file from the bank that has every transaction that happened for us, and we'll put that, normalize that data, and then reconcile that against what we told the bank to do to make sure that if anything gets missed in between, like any payment got missed in between, that we have a record of it and we can go figure it out, like we can reconcile it. And this is important just for our own financial accounting, but also to make sure that if anything gets lost in that loop, that we don't uh, leave money on the so just like manual table. Error happens. What's that? There's problems with manual error then. Yeah, or it, could be, or it could be system error, it could be fraud. We deal with a lot of uh, chargeback fraud. That's one of the things I'll say in the takeaway slide is 
as the volume of money that you deal with gets bigger, the number of bad guys also gets bigger, like people who are attempting to just steal from you. Is there another question? Yeah. So do you have to report uh, government tax forms in 192 countries, people who take in money? We, we don't handle this perfectly in every country right now, but we do, um, we do give out tax forms to all US hosts, and we also collect VAT, which is this variable occupancy tax that is uh, important in Europe. Uh, but we don't cover every single tax law in every single country yet. Like, obviously, that would be a lot of work. But so what we try to do is just like cover the ones that are the biggest uh, issues right now, like the, the biggest countries that are worried about it, and we'll, like, we'll keep working our way out to the rest of the countries. Uh, this is going to take a long time, right? It's going to take a long time to get all of that exactly right. But um, at the moment, we give every single US host um, the tax forms that they need to pay taxes on the income that they earn uh, while hosting on Airbnb. Do you also deal with money laundering laws? Yeah, we do. We actually have an uh, in-house risk team. Uh, and what the risk team does is identify patterns of like chargeback fraud, um, account takeovers, money laundering. Like money laundering is one of those things that sounds very James Bondy, but people really do use systems like this to uh, money launder, and so we have uh, things that we can use to try to algorithmically detect that kind of behavior, and then put. So basically, what we do is we have algorithms that will detect behavior that look like fraud or look like money laundering, which are two different kinds of fraud, and then those get kicked out to a manual queue, and we have uh, agents that look at all those items to make sure that they're either good or bad. Yeah, how do you keep track of? The question is, how do we keep track of countries that the U.S. government won't let us do business in? Yeah, do you use that like a big like regulatory like, thing you have to deal with? Yeah, well, we don't do business in Iran right now is the way that we've dealt with that one. I don't think that we have too many other uh, places where we're not allowed to operate right now. We had um, trying, we, we have one country that we weren't operating in for the wrong reasons that we opened up recently, and, and, it, and it was fine. But um, yeah, I don't, we're not doing business in Iran right now. What about places that are just dangerous? Is there any exposure to Airbnb for like you know, from from the traveler perspective if you send them into like some political hotspot or somewhere where there's a lot of violence? Yeah. We don't really get into that, like in terms of personal in insurance or anything. Like we're, you know, we're in the business of connecting travelers with with hosts. I think when it comes to personal liability, it's kind of on the individual to make sure that they're not putting themselves in harm's way, right? Like this is why we have travel advisories that go out to everyone. Um, what we do do is insurance for hosts to make sure that like if a guest behaves poorly or you know causes some kind of issue with the house or whatever, we have a guarantee. Like we have the you know Airbnb million dollar guarantee. If something bad happens to your house, then uh, that's like insurance for you to make sure that it can be repaired. But in terms of traveling to hotspots and things like that, like for personal liability, it's on the individual. When you go on travel, do they book you hotel or I always stay in Airbnbs every, everywhere I go. And actually, it's it's a little funny. So I was just at uh, Grace Hopper conference um, a few weeks ago, and we got three Airbnb houses, and we all stayed in them. It was super fun. Yeah, I'm actually also a pretty regular host on Airbnb. We try to make it so that, like, you know, people don't travel all the time, but you can be hosting all the time. So we um, we give people incentives to travel, and then we also try to uh, incentivize people to be hosts themselves because if you don't use the product, it's hard to know what it's like. Do yeah. know who you are when you travel? What's that? Like, do they know that there's a big wig from Airbnb sitting on their couch? I think most hosts don't really think about. They probably wouldn't think that I'm a big wig. They probably think like, oh, hey, some dude who works at Airbnb is coming to stay at my house. It'd be interesting, like, oh, you should put this button on your site. You know, like, you have this like unfiltered ad. <laughs> oh, we actually we did that uh, like three weeks ago. We did a host meetup in, or, sorry, it must have been like over a month ago now. We did a host meetup in New York with 50 of our top hosts in New York, like people who have like the highest occupancy rates. And it was an evening of that. I have like my notes out all night, and I was just writing down like every single complaint that they had about the site. And it was so funny, like some of these people are like so engaged, they were like, what I want is a way that I can download um, to Excel a file of everybody who stayed in my place and how long they stayed so that I can do metrics on how to increase my occupancy rates. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, all right, dude. <laughs> all right, Jason. That's obviously a keeper post. The other thing that I found is that um, there are a fair number of people in New York who are interested in like hosts in New York 
and it, this is around the world, but this is the stories that I got from New York, who are interested in helping other people be hosts. So like, even if you don't have enough time to manage your calendar and manage availability and everything else, there are other hosts who are interested in just helping property manage your place so that you can earn some money from it and maybe they take a cut from it. It's kind of interesting, like some other business models that are um, being created on top of this stuff. Yeah. So connecting the scale, just sort of the technical scale earlier versus and also that this legal scale, right? So if you had to give people 1099s, when did you decide to do that? Like, was that something that you know what we know is going to be a big problem, let's do it from the beginning, or did that suddenly dawn on you? How did you decide to navigate, when to navigate these things? That, uh, that was not something that we did from the beginning, and it did dawn on us after when, when it was pointed out to us by a regulator that this would be income earned, and we really need to think about that. And I think the you know the founders were kind of like, oh yeah, taxes. <laughs> Went back and started figuring it out. At this point, the way that we're dealing with it is that um, you know it's about the regulatory issues are very complicated around this for taxes and for everything else. Uh, what we're trying to do is just address things in terms of like the scale of where we're operating. So try to solve for the tax problems in the biggest markets that we're operating in. Understand what it is that the local governments really want to get out of it and make sure that we're solving for them and also solving for our hosts on, on the platform. Like it sometimes can be a little, you know, without going too far off here, it can be a little um, hard to tell between what a host wants and what a government wants and whether they're always you know, in line with each other, so we try to walk the balance as best we can. Do you wait those are problems? You know, as you're scaling, do you wait those are problems and let that sort of be the trigger, or do you try to, how, how do you navigate that in terms of scaling? The question is, do we wait until, until there's a problem? Uh, we definitely don't. We're trying to be very proactive about that, uh, working with local governments and, you know, satisfying their needs and satisfying the needs of hosts. We're not, we don't want to just sit around and wait until we get in trouble and then, uh, you know, and then do the right thing. I think that we want to be very proactive about it. I mean, like we want Airbnb to be operating above board uh, everywhere in the world. It should be. Yeah. Kind of piggybacking off that question a little bit. You guys had a lot of like legal issues in New York and I think San Francisco when you guys started out with just the regulations regarding hotel laws and stuff like that. Uh, when did that come about and how are you guys dealing with it? How did you guys deal with that? Yeah, I don't want to go into too much depth on, on this particular topic because things are a little hot in New York right now. I don't know if you guys have seen like the recent stuff that's going on. Um, what I'll say is that we are trying to take a very hard stand against giving up our users' data and our host data in New York for what we believe is more of a phishing expedition by the New York justice system than like actually targeting bad behavior on the platform. And so we're taking a pretty hard stand against that stuff right now, which I personally feel great about. I think it's the right thing to do. Uh, for people who are just like earning some extra income off of their own use space, uh, but it's a complex issue, so I don't want to get like too far uh, down the path on it today. Could you talk a little bit about partnership? If there's a, any partnership that helps Airbnb grow with their land, or it wasn't anything like that. The question is, were there any partnerships that helped us grow? Um, well, I, I mean, not to be too pandering or anything, but I mean, having a, a huge amount of like payments is this really complicated problem. Having partners that were able to, that we were able to leverage to solve that problem, like partners like Braintree, was a huge deal. Like just getting that problem off the table and letting us focus on the problem of travel and not the problem of payments was um, a really big deal. Another partnership that seems obvious, but I'll call it out anyway, is AWS, right? Like we've been built on AWS from, from the very beginning and at the scale that we operate at, um, that has been a huge problem set, like managing all those servers and infrastructure that we haven't had to devote huge mindshare to. Instead, we've been able to concentrate on the problem that's unique to us. All right, I'm just gonna cut to my last slide and then we can do more questions. Um, so I just wanted to give like a few takeaways. I hope this stuff is useful for you guys, but like uh, for, from payments. One is that, you know, the Airbnb back at the beginning was working in an environment where there weren't a lot of great companies that were available to, to do this stuff. Like Braintree was uh, much earlier in the cycle than it is right now. Um, PayPal is good for some things, not good for others. Like it was hard to get negotiate good rates. Um, today, there's a lot of really good providers for this. I would say if you don't need to solve the payments problem for your specific use case, like try to leverage a partner uh, for the stuff right now, you can get really good rates. Um, I made this point already, but as the more volume of money moves through your system, lots of scary behavior will emerge. Like you'll find a lot of bad actors who are trying to defraud you and steal money from you. It happens to us every single day. There's people trying to get, um, oh, you know, get at the money. They're trying to take over people's accounts. They're trying to change payout information and do bad things to steal money. Um, 
depending on whether you're in the US or international, people's payment preferences, I talked about this a little bit with like Western Union and Argentina, like preferences are very different. Like the way people want to pay and get paid is not like everybody doesn't use credit card and want a direct bank transfer. Like people have different opinions. So depending on what market you're going after, you have to really cater to that, uh, to that place. Um, let's see, I talked a little bit about this. It's not always obvious when to add a new provider. Like, it's a chicken and egg problem. You might not, it might not represent a lot of your volume today, but it might also be capping your growth. Because people, you know, if they really want to go to Western Union, if you don't have Western Union, maybe they're not going to use your site, right? We talked a little bit about bank, bank reconciliation and foreign exchange. And the last thing is, um, don't just round everything up, which is, I'm not sure how I'm supposed to talk about this, but back in the early days to make it easy, we decided that we were going to round everything up. So everything is stored in whole dollar amounts in Airbnb's back end today, which it turns out when you get into taxes, it's really complicated because the tax man cares all the way down to the penny. So that's my final piece of parting advice is don't just round everything up. <laughs> you said whole dollars? Yeah, like we'll round up to the dollar. One dollar, two dollar? Yeah. That's it. More questions? I don't know. I'll go to somebody who hasn't asked a question before. Do you have one? No? Okay. Um, so, are, are you seeing any kind of response or what's happening with hotels and other providers that you're kind of competing with? Because you're bringing all this new inventory in the market. I think that we've, we've stayed like a little bit out of hotel turf war stuff, like we really position ourselves differently uh, from hotels. I mean, they obviously care about it, but we, we have not tried to do any like head to head uh, combat with hotels. One thing that I think is interesting or an interesting statistic about everybody that I'll, I'll share is that more than 30% of all of our travel happens outside of a place that has a major hotel chain. So we're actually like kind of expanding the category of travel. And it makes sense, I actually had a family stay with me a few months ago and they came and stayed at my place and Palo Alto, and the reason they stayed with me instead of staying at the hotel down the street is because they could walk from my house to the to their grandkids who they were visiting. And so, if you think about that use case times quite a bit, it can give you something that's like much more local and outside of where they're even where yeah, it even makes sense to have a hotel. Sure. I'm sorry, you're saying hotels are coming to you or trying to partnerships, or if they're doing any kind of moves that are like legally to hurt you. Or no, I mean, there's certainly like a hotel lobby that wants us to be more regulated, but we haven't really gone head to head with them. Yeah. Going back to the marketing discussion you had earlier, do you have any idea, this is before your time, what were the different marketing channels that worked best for them? Was it SEO? Was it uh, Facebook? Yeah. Okay. The, the question is what are the like highest value or highest ROI marketing channels? Be a good way to say it. Um, <coughs> by far the highest ROI marketing channel that we have today, and I think it's always been this case, is uh, Google Ads. So in search, you've got like high intent, we get um, you know great click-through rates on those ads, it makes sense, people are searching for travel, they get an Airbnb listing, um, we advertise at that point and they click through. Uh, Facebook is not bad, uh, but it's not uh, nearly to that level right now. I apologize to my former employer. Um, and uh, SEO has been important, but it hasn't been as much of a driver as the uh, as the paid campaigns that we've done. I think there's actually a lot more that we can do with SEO than we than we do today. When did you start organizing those teams? How do you find people that most to write the first time? The question is about the growth team that Airbnb and when did we start organizing that? Yeah, how to find and hire. Um, we actually look for people who. Uh, the question is how do we build it and how do we find and hire people for that team. Um, we started, I think that they started the concept of a growth team before I got there. In the beginning of the year, I tried to like make it a, a more defined thing because I wanted to bring some of that across from the Facebook growth team. Uh, we find and hire people uh, who have to be like strong generalists. You don't necessarily have to have a background in growth to be a good growth engineer, but we also find people who are really motivated by data. It's, it's like a different mindset a bit. Like you, if you're, if what you're really excited about is being able to go home and you know tell your mom and your friends, like I built this thing, check it out. You might not be a great fit for the growth team. It'd be a great fit for the growth team if you're like, I ran this experiment and increased conversion by 4% and that's gonna yield you know, X million more or whatever down the line like that. Like try to find people who fit that mindset and get excited about that kind of work. I should probably make this the last question because I know my 
Cool. What's your biggest engineering challenge? The biggest engineering challenge. I think that um, you know we've we've talked a bunch about payments and other things. I think that the biggest challenge that we'll have in the next year is um, around matching and like the algorithmic side of that. Like, how do we make it so that every single time you search on Airbnb, you're successful? So like, I want to find a place. Every single time, you should find a place, and it should be easy. But it shouldn't be this like exhaustive eight hour searching process. It should be that like the top five places that you're gonna to wanna to stay are there recommended to you right away. And we can do that for users who are on the site because we've got their past searching behavior and we can do it for new users who come in because we can like cross reference them to other people who have done similar searches before and just get them the best recommendations. But I think that that matching problem and turning that into something where um, every single time somebody searches on Airbnb, they end up successful and having a listing is probably one of the biggest challenges that we have over the next year. One quick and one last thing. What's next? What are you guys going to do again? Innovations. What's next for Airbnb? What's next for Airbnb? Oh, there's so many ways to answer that question. Um, the big things that we're working on right now is we're getting it so that you can do everything you need to do on Airbnb as a host on the mobile apps. And what we're finding is this is a huge percentage of all of our hosts use the mobile apps primarily, and now we're just like building all the functionality that we need for that to be like awesome and seamless. And then as we get into next year, the big thing is going to be around ma matching and conversion, like getting, like I was talking about there, like getting people perfectly matched, making it a seamless booking experience. Um, if you get a little bit longer term, Airbnb is about more than just like the place you're going to sleep at. Airbnb should be about the entire travel experience. Right, so one day we want it to be end to end, like every single step along the way on that trip, Airbnb is with you, like removing friction from the trip, making it easier. So like, so like you book something, but you know you walk up to the front door and the door automatically unlocks. You walk in and you know Airbnb automatically pulls up like the places that have great takeout next to there in case you want to get a meal. Like every step along the way, we can be making the trip more effortless, and I think that that's like down the line, that's where we want to get to. Thanks again, guys.